Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second day of the Ojai Festival and these Ojai Talks. Um, it's a joy to be joined once again by our music director, Jeremy Denk. The subject of the day is a hero musician um, and the scholar thinker about music. I know very much a role model and friend of Jeremy's and um, for me as well from my youngest days as a student. Here's my very dog-eared, yellow, highlighted copy, carefully written that I bought it in 1975 of Charles Rosen's The Classical Style. And um, now for generations of music students and music lovers, um, this is a book that provides such deep ear-opening insight into the workings of the music of Beethoven, um, Haydn, and Mozart. Um, and as I think all of you know, tonight we'll see the world premiere of a new opera with a libretto by Jeremy Denk. Uh, inspired by an idea of Jeremy's uh, on the classical style with music composed by Stephen Stuckey, who we'll meet at the end of this afternoon's time together and talk about the writing of the, the opera. The opera um, celebrates, first of all, I think Jeremy's admiration. And Mike, do I have the, the slide of the photo? Here's a very lovely photo of Jeremy and Charles Rosen um, playing forehands at, at the piano. So it grows out of a, a very meaningful personal friendship that lasted about five years, I think, the uh -huh. last five years of, of uh, Charles Rosen's life. And the opera, which I've had the privilege of seeing the dress rehearsal, and some of you may have had the same opportunity as well, has Charles Rosen as a character, as a central character. It also has Beethoven, Mozart, and Haydn as characters, um, as you might expect in an opera about this book. Um, but it also has um, Donna Anna from Don Giovanni, the Commendatore from Don Giovanni, uh, Don Giovanni himself, um, Robert. It's worth, it's worth refreshing your knowledge of the first scene of Don Giovanni for, the, for maximum enjoyment. Yeah. Um, Robert Schumann makes a very touching and meaningful cameo appearance at the end uh, in ways we'll talk about. And I think all of that will be fairly clear to you. But um, what may be less apparent are three fairly memorable characters who bear the names tonic, dominant, and subdominant, <laughs> uh, who each have very distinct psyches that are reflective of their role uh, within classical harmony. And we thought that there'd be no better place to start than to have Jeremy introduce to you his three of his leading characters, tonic, dominant, subdominant, and to explain to you how they came to their psychic states. Well, I mean, I mean uh, many people will get a little alarmed by these technical terms. Um, maybe not the nerdier among you, but, but the normal innocent listener. Uh, and, and Charles himself, in the course of the opera, explains this new, something in the classical style that was different from what happened before, which is a new kind of emphatic polarity between the tonic and the dominant and how that became such an important part of the style. You know, if you don't know the terms tonic and dominant, you, you still know, of course, what tonic and dominant are. You're living it right now. Any, anything, almost anything you've ever listened to is, is completely consumed with it. And um, tonic, dominant, or um, that's the tonic. To the dominant. Rum, rum, rum. Back to the tonic. Or tonic. To the dominant. Staying on the dominant. 
back to the tonic. The tonic is the home key of the piece, and the dominant, of course, is the chord built on the fifth scale degree. One, two, three, do. What, is, what are the sort of <laughs> <laughs> Do, re, mi, fa, so. And you build a chord on there. And that chord, of course, always wants to go to. Or if you add the seventh, even more it wants to go there because those two notes really, really, really want to. And, and um, you know, I could go a bazillion examples, like Eroica Symphony, tonic, dominant, dominant, tonic, do tonic, dominant, tonic. I mean, they built a whole empire on this, this ridiculous <laughs> thing. And may, maybe my favorite example altogether in all of music is, is this last movement of Opus 109, Beethoven which is, um, I remember a theorist once said, it's like Beethoven stares at you in the face very intently and beautifully and says, tonic goes to dominant. It goes like, one, two, five. Tonic goes to the dominant. Tonic goes to the dominant. Tonic goes to the dark. Yeah? And this incredible theme. Yeah. <laughs> this incredible theme of just unbelievable transcendental beauty is made of kind of the most idiotic harmonic scheme imaginable. And yet, yeah? So somehow they built this tremendous language on, on these two chords. And the sub the, so I've developed a, I decided they should be opera buffa characters in their own right. And the tonic being the home key and very settled and comfortable, the sense that we've arrived, he's a fairly narcissistic individual, <laughs> as you may find. And he, he's a bit of a one note wonder also. <laughs> and the poor dominant who we run across is always wanting to resolve to the tonic. <laughs> And so she has a very sad sort of high maintenance aria <laughs> where she laments her inability to resolve. And Steve wrote the most brilliantly funny kind of, because every time she says resolve, or uh, he does something in the bass so that it doesn't resolve. And uh, there's all these millions of deceptive cadences in there. Then it says, it sounds like a cliche, she says. And he does the most cliched imaginable harmonic motion under that. So there's a lot of that kind of insider musical humor. and then. So the tonic and the dominant are always arguing because they're in this emphatic polarity that defines the classical style. And then I wanted the subdominant, as Charles you, says. You should introduce. Oh, yeah, I should say. Yeah. So if, if, oh, whoa. Am I still on? Yeah. If for the sake of argument we're in C major, and why not? Um, and, and, and the dominant is G major, if I put a nice, in my C major, that takes us sort of backwards down the circle of fifth to the subdominant. And it so happens it's a favorite trick of Mozart's in the last section of a sonata form after all the rivalry between the tonic and the dominant and all the tension and whatever stuff happens, that he suddenly moves into the subdominant and it releases all the energy and the sort of drive of the piece into this, and it has this tremendous serenity. And so I created this sort of earth goddess, earth mother character who comes in in the middle of this destroying the argument, and suddenly the tonic, of course, now this is really nerdy, of course, the tonic is actually the dominant of the subdominant. Because <laughs> everything's, uh, you know, that's how music theory is. Um, <laughs> and, and, so the tonic immediately finds himself attracted to the subdominant in the same way that the dominant strikes the tonic. And so it becomes this codependent love triangle situation, <laughs> which, which, and that, that is the short explanation of that for some mystifying scene. But I hope you'll enjoy this kind of, um, it's like theory 101 made into an opera, which is, <laughs> it's never been attempted before. <laughs> and, uh, but the thing is that Mozart uses all these harmonies in exactly this way to paint his characters as either settled or agitated or, you know, and so I'm just um, making a little bit explicit what's already implicit, I guess. Yeah. After, um, after I heard it, I thought, 
This should be offered in all basic theory courses. <laughs> because it makes it quite, um, quite immediate, uh, the, the color and function of, of these chords within tonal harmony. Um, and you should also know that the scene, the, the primary scene with the three of them is set in a bar. Um, so um, I'm not going to give away the most irresistible joke of the opera, but when it comes, you'll know. Is that the most irresistible joke? I'm, I'm well, very you depressed didn't, now. You didn't, you didn't resist it. I didn't resist it, that's true. It's, I didn't resist it's it. Let's just say it's a groaner. Yeah. <laughs> there are many deliberate groaners, you must be admitted. Um, but what it actually, what's lovely about this piece is that in a very witty piece. Um, it's, it touches on, I think, the strength of this remarkable book. And, and maybe we should take a minute talking about it. Um, you know, we, li we listen to these pieces for affect and the draw and the power and the sensuality and every, every other dimension that these extraordinary pieces have on us and, and why they've endured and connect with succeeding generations of listeners and musicians. And what Charles Rosen did in a way that very few writers about music have done um, is describe how the workings of the music lead to that affect. Much music theory writing um, looks like set theory or some sort of mathematical uh, analysis. It's, it's, it's about a non-living thing and, and it's sort of paper thinking. And what Rosen's genius in this book um, is, is that he connects the theory to the ear and then to the mind and the heart and, and he's, his prose is extraordinary. So. His just the, even if you can't make your way through the musical examples, reading it for the descriptive prose, I think is worthwhile. What the, I, I'd, I'd be curious for your take when you suggest this book to friends, whether musicians or music lovers who may not have theoretical backgrounds. What do you what do you suggest? How do you suggest well, they it's, go yeah, at that it? Charles doesn't. He makes some effort to be accessible, but not always. And, and if you're a general reader and you don't read music, for example, there are some large passages that are not going to be accessible. Um, and you know, it's kind of amazing that a book like this, in a way, got published and had such a huge, um, because it's, it's fairly wonky. And, and that's part of the raison d'etre of the opera, is to sort of bring, bring to life this thing. But, um, but you're right, the, the descriptive passages where Charles connects, you know, late Beethoven, what Beethoven did to the language, or there's one that I picked in the opera that is so extraordinary about the relationship between grief and sensuality mm. in Mozart, and the, that, that always at the moments of greatest tragedy in Mozart, there is also this kind of implicit um, kind of luscious sensuality or even sexuality, and then the, the, those two don't conflict with each other, but they kind of weirdly strengthen each other. And the music is so seductive and so tragic at the same time. And, and Steve very subtly and, and uh, elegantly supplies the exact perfect musical examples while Charles tells this greatness of Mozart. And he, he plays the little moments from Don Giovanni, and yet you're like, yes, that is it, exactly. You know, Don Giovanni being, of course, one of the more sexed up of, of operas. But, um, uh, <laughs> But it, that's the thing, when Charles is speaking so profound. There's another one in the last thing, the last scene that we picked about. But you were saying your favorite one is the one about uh, Brahms at the very end oh. of the, yeah, yeah. Well, let me, let me just do a little digression. This is an example. This is in the very last page of the book. Um, and there's a little throwaway line about Brahms. It's, it's the, the classical style is wound down and he's talking about its effect on succeeding um, generations of composers. And we'll talk a minute about the profound effect on Schumann and Schumann's commentary on the classical style. And, and so it's just this kind of conclusion and looking forward. Um, and, and he says, I'm just going to skip through it. Um, 
A style, when it is no longer the natural mode of expression, gains a new life, a shadowy life in death, as a prolongation of the past. We imagine ourselves able to revive the past through its art, to perpetuate it by continuing to work within its conventions. For this illusion of reliving history, the style must be prevented from becoming truly alive once again, which is exactly where the opera begins. Mozart, Beethoven, and Haydn are in heaven and incredibly frustrated that they've become these dead plaster busts on top of the piano <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> are, are no longer living. And they begin this quest to find this man, Charles Rosen, who really understands them and can help bring them back to life. <laughs> That's, that's the plot of the opera, such as it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and here's the, the two sentences about Brahms, which I think are more valuable than any three dozen books about Brahms. The sense of the irre irrecoverable past, however, is omnipresent in the music of Brahms, resignedly eclectic, ambiguous without irony. The depth of his feeling of loss gave an intensity to Brahms's work that no other imitator of the classical tradition ever reached. He may be said to have made music out of his openly expressed regret that he was born too late. Um, and Charles, and, give it up for Charles. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> you know, that's three sentences about Brahms in the context of another book th that is so deeply insightful on the tug and the pull of Brahms's music um, uh, that it's, it's very much representative of the book. One fascinating thing about the book is that it was, uh, I think it first came out in 1971, and in 1972, it won the National Book Award. Um, which is immensely rare for any book about music or music criticism or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And the, interesting, the other interesting thing about it is that initially, at least, um, the, a lot of the scholarly and musicological establishment didn't even particularly pay attention or regard the book. It was never reviewed um, originally in the Journal of the American Musicological Society because it was a book by a pianist. It wasn't a serious scholarly book. <laughs> Reminds me that there's a famous saying by Randall Jarrell about that. He says, uh, uh, it's like a, a pig ju judging a bacon contest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you know what I mean? What, what does that pig know about bacon? You know? um, and that, that's how sometimes... <laughs> that's and how musicologists feel about musicians sometimes, and vice versa. And, and um, Jeremy allows his revenge on the topic because the other character we didn't mention is a, a PhD musicology student named Henry Snibblesworth. Um, <laughs> who is a memorable character in the opera, and I don't think he needs further explanation. No, because he explains himself at great length, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> and everything else that happens, yeah. The book and the opera come to a close with uh, a not very long but deeply moving description of Schumann's fantasy in C major. Um, and the origin of the piece is that Liszt um, was trying to enlist other composers to raise money for a monument to Beethoven, for each of them to write a piece that would then be sold and be a kind of charity effort to, to uh, raise money for the statue to Beethoven or a monument to Beethoven. And as Charles has said memorably, the piece Schumann himself wrote is probably the most moving monument to Beethoven. And we're going to end this segment. Wait, let me just say one short thing before you do that, because it's important to know that the Schumann fantasy is built on a particular Beethoven quote. Well, um, no, I, I was going you to You were going to do that. No, no. You were, you're the pianist. I was going to ask you to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, there's the, the last song, or not the last, but the second to last song of An die Ferne Geliebte, of Beethoven. Uh, 
I'm gonna forget it now. So the, the main and and Schumann rewrites it like this. You hear the connection? And he goes up. And you can almost feel the classical style dying at that very moment in a weird way. And this new, no, I mean, not serious, very seriously, and very kind of the emergence of this romantic um, other world. Um, yeah, so. Uh, and I, so, so what we have for you is a video of a concert performance given by Charles Rosen of the original version of the Schumann fantasy. And uh, we'll just watch the first movement, which, which ends with the quote that Jeremy just played for you. And you will next encounter it tonight. Um, and I, I hope it will be meaningful to you to see Charles Rosen himself in, in a piece he loved deeply and championed endlessly and wrote about so eloquently. Um, and, and this opera pays homage to uh, his love for this piece and his recognition of its importance. So we're going to, um, I, I think you'll stay and watch. Oh, but, absolutely. But, but, but um, Jeremy, after this, will go off to his tasks of the day. So before we let him go off completely, I just wanted to thank him again. If we can turn the lights off. I'd particularly like to say a few words about the fantasy because I'm uh, playing the version which is not called fantasy in C major, but a version called Dichtungen für das Pianoforte, that is a uh, poems for the piano. And uh, it's the manuscript in Budapest that was discovered by Alan Walker a few years ago. And it's natural that the manuscript of the Schumann fantasy should be in Budapest because it was written at the request of Liszt, and uh, Liszt, it must have gotten somehow into Liszt's archives. And uh, the, uh, the manuscript is different in one important respect. There are a few details, a uh, few notes added, and a uh, few things that I keep. But the last page is very different, and goes back to the end of the first movement. And it's uh, such a beautiful ending, uh, and a pity that Schumann cut it out that having seen it, I really <laughs> refuse to give it up. And uh, the, the manuscript also has titles for the different movements, which is a help in performance. The first movement is called Ruins, and the second movement is called Triumphal Arch, and the third movement is called Constellation. And the whole piece was written at the request of Liszt in order to raise money by selling the pieces of various composers that Liszt has uh, to sell money, uh, to, uh, to get money by, for a monument to Beethoven. And in fact, the last page of the first movement and the last page of the version I'm playing both contain a quotation from Beethoven's On die Ferne Geliebte, To the Distant Beloved. And this is particularly interesting musically because the whole first movement is based on the theme by Beethoven that you only hear in its original form at the end, but you will hear echoes of it throughout the entire first movement. And fragments of it appear uh, falling to ruins, almost, if you want to put it that way. And the reappearance at the end as a kind of memory, which it is in the Beethoven. In the Beethoven, it is a memory that returns of the first song. And the list is really recalling the entire Beethoven song cycle. Uh, uh, Schumann is recalling the entire Beethoven song cycle. Um, so that is the version I'm going to play this evening.
the concert took place in 1985 in Atlanta, Georgia, and this is a um, wonderful, wonderful document. And the man who had the foresight to um, record it, uh, the entire recital, and it includes an interview with Charles Rosen as well as a man named Frank Bell, uh, who did it as a labor of love. And as best as I could find online, um, the DVD remains available. Um, he has a company called the virtuosopianist.org, um, which is still an active website and it's listed as for sale. So if you'd like to see the entire recital, um, it would be lovely to make sure that this precious document has continues to, to have a life. Um, We'll now uh, turn to the second portion of our uh, time together this afternoon, and it's my privilege to invite up three very different perspectives on Charles Rosen and his work. Uh, please welcome Don Randall, Henry Zerner, and Timo Andrus. Um, let me uh, begin introductions with, uh, to, to your right. Um, Don Randall is most recently um, just retired as president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, uh, where he had such tremendous positive effect on American philanthropy and, and also um, philan wise philanthropy in the arts as well prior to that. He was the president of the University of Chicago, and prior to that, he was provost at Cornell University. Um, but he's a musicologist. I shouldn't <laughs> neglect to mention that. <laughs> and uh, for students of various generations, our standard reference work was the Harvard Dictionary of Music edited by Don Randall. So uh, it is in his, in his role, uh, among the multiple roles he's played in his distinguished career as a musicologist and uh, uh, friend and, and uh, uh, understanding um, perspective on Charles Rosen that we greet him today. Timo Andrus is a pianist and composer who came out of the very lively composition program at the Yale School of Music. And we have um, the good fortune of hearing um, at least two pieces of T Timo's um, this weekend. His rethinking of Mozart's coronation concerto, or his um, perspective on Mozart's coronation concerto, which, um, whether it was intended or not, sheds extraordinary light on some of the very issues that Charles Rosen talks about in the classical style and the pull of tonality and tonal direction. And um, to uh, my immediate left is Henry Zerner, who was a lifelong friend of Charles Rosen's and frequent collaborator in a number of scholarly uh, works that they did together. Um, Henry is professor of the history of art and architecture at Harvard University. And Henry, you have um, pride of place. Um, I, just before we came up, I said, how long did you know Charles? And the answer is worth hearing. Well, uh, oh, um, could you grab the mic from, we're going to share two mics among three. <laughs> Met him in 1950. Nope. It's not on. Okay. Uh, Switch mics. Yeah. Let's let's try the one Don has. Yes. <laughs> no. D uh, d uh, take oh, the one Don has. This one doesn't work. Ah. Good. Okay. I'm not as stupid as you. I met him. Uh, my memory is Can quite, you hold it closer? In 1949, when I was 10 years old, uh, and I am told that he was a friend of my mother's, 
had become recently a friend of my mother's, and uh, I'm told that uh, he took me, my, my, mother was, my mother was a single mother, my father died, and she was very busy, and he kindly took me to the zoo. <laughs> uh, and I'm told that I came back, and uh, I was asked uh, how it was, and uh, I said he was very intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you guessed raspy humor. <laughs> and uh, I can't even tell you uh, what we talked about. Yes, hold, hold it because, closer. Uh, yeah. Because I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not used to uh, holding the mic so close. Um, he had recently completed his PhD at Princeton University, which was on, uh, the, on La Fontaine, the fabulous the French author. And uh, being a French schoolboy, uh, 10 years old, that's one author I really knew reasonably well by heart. <laughs> so we had something to talk about. It was the fables of La Fontaine. <laughs> and I guess he talked about it very well. You can read the dissertation if you <laughs> go to Princeton. So that's how long I have known him. But uh, we became, I mean, he, he was, became then a close friend of my mother's and then when I was of age, uh, uh, really mm, by 1955, we became very close. Uh, and by then I was 16, and uh, uh, he stayed actually with us in Paris for several years uh, in, in my mother's apartment. So then, you know, my, the rest of my life, uh, the rest of our lives were very closely tied together. If put together yeah. a very beautiful um, so personal I, photo album, which if we could I've take a look at. I've put together some, some of photos that are perfectly well known, but this is the end. Oh, so we need to maybe somehow we can, get to the beginning. Can we get back to the beginning? There we go. Okay. And if we can turn the lights off again for a moment, just to yeah, see Yeah, if you better. could, so that you can see the, the pictures a little better, maybe. Uh, so this is uh, the classical style, since this is what we are talking about, and uh, as you can see, this is only a few of the various avatars of that book, which uh, was translated in God knows how many languages and went through heaven knows how many editions, and is still available, and you can buy it uh, at a stand at the festival. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, can, can we have the next? Uh, what I've done is to, in a few images, to go back in Charles's life. And uh, this is one of the last pictures which I took myself, I believe, and uh, in the very last uh, time, a part of his life when he was basically expecting, expected to die of cancer, as a sort of view of eternity, as you can see. I mean, as a certain to me, a great deal of pathos uh, in that. But even in his last, in late days, he was often more not so anguished. Uh, can we have the next? And uh, you can see him uh, much more uh, cheerful. I wanted to show you this one because uh, this is at home at the piano, which uh, uh, Jeremy uh, knows well and will recognize the sort of messy, casual uh, aspect of the of the setting in in New York. Uh, the next one, uh, if you have any questions, of course. No, uh, uh, so th this is just uh, to give a sense of the expressiveness of his face and. Uh, which I'm sure you saw also in the uh, in those uh, uh, videos where uh, the, the, the expressiveness is quite uh, clear. I particularly like the one, the sort of meditative one on the in the pose of melancholy on the left, which is very nice. That's uh, I don't know who took that photograph, uh, but the others are taken by a very old friend. Uh, Catherine Temerson, who was the daughter of the first, viol the, uh, <clears throat> first violin of the uh, New York Symphony, was a very close friend of Charles. They often played.
played together. Uh, next. Now, I couldn't resist because this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, and it's Charles with my mother, who was a wonderful woman. Uh, and uh, he, as you can see, he was a very uh, dashing, uh, at that point, very dashing young man. This must be in the second part of, second part of the 50s, of the 1950s. He is in his late 20s at this point. And uh, very, you can see why I was very taken with him. Uh, <coughs> uh, next, uh, this is very, to me, a very funny photograph. Uh, I, I found it recently buried in a drawer, and uh, <coughs> it is in bad shape, you can see. But it must have been taken as a picture for publicity you, can, you see him uh, coming out of a, of a plane, and uh, it was taken when he was uh, touring with the Seventh, Symphony, Seventh Army Symphony throughout Europe. This was a part of the post-war, uh, I suspect, in 51, uh, uh, 51 or 52, and they went all over Europe playing various concertos. And uh, Air France must have thought it was a good idea, good publicity. <laughs> I, don't, I doubt that they actually used it. Uh, next, uh, this is a photo, this is clearly a, a professional photograph uh, uh, of uh, Charles when he was, I think, probably about 14, and uh, uh, at a time when. Uh, he was a, a pupil. Uh, he studied with uh, Rosenthal, and there was great. Uh, certainly, those pictures were uh, taken uh, because there was great hope. Of, uh, and and as a to sort of uh, curiosity, uh, Rosenthal had agreed, uh, and his wife uh, had agreed to teach him free, but with the understanding that. If he had a great career as a prodigy, they would get 15%. <laughs> <laughs> I, have the, I, I, I've, I have actually found the contract in, in a, in a, a, at the bottom of a, of a drawer. Uh, his parents uh, didn't want him to do that, so it never happened. So <laughs> the Rosenthal's were out of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But, <coughs> sorry, but Charles remained very, very extremely grateful uh, to his tut their tutoring, and uh, they, they were not recompensed in, in money, but they were recompensed in feeling and, and uh, gratitude, <laughs> which would, might not have been their choice. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, well, we get back to the very beginning uh, next. Uh, and this is the four people at the right are uh, uh, his father and his mother, uh, Anita, who was a very beautiful woman who was uh, an aspiring actress. It never happened, uh, her career as the, and uh, the two boys are Charles and uh, his brother, his slightly younger brother, Donald who was a, a very distinguished, uh, brilliant uh, biologist, who was the curator of, the, um, of fish at the Museum of Natural History in New York, whom I knew very well, and who very sadly died quite young of a brain tumor. But he, is a, he remained a, a great uh, a name, a real name in the world of uh, biology. He was also a paleontologist and uh, 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 as well as a biologist. And uh, so there uh, they are, and his father, whom you see on the right, who was very much older than his mother. They were about 20 years apart, and uh, Charles didn't like his father very much, actually. There was a, but he was a very attached to his mother, who became, who was uh, quite young, uh, had Parkinson's disease, and uh, died fairly young. Uh, but, um, well, can we have the uh, next? So I think it's uh, uh, interesting to see how our, 
out of this little, <laughs> little brat comes the Charles Rosen, who is uh, part of history. And uh, so a couple more images uh, next. Uh, this is uh, Elizabeth Sifton on the left, and on the right, George Brazile. They, they are both, uh, George Brazile is a, was a publisher, and Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Sifton is still a major editor, uh, uh, a very, dis very distinguished, very wonderful woman. She's also the daughter of Niebuhr, the, the uh, <coughs> theologian, theologian and a uh, great, great lady. And uh, I wanted to say a few words maybe about how the classical style came about. Uh, Charles uh, was trained in, in literature, but he had never had any intention of uh, having a career as a literary scholar. He, was, he only always knew he was a pianist. And, <clears throat> uh, but, uh, when he, re he did quite a few recordings in the 50s and 60s, uh, and well, especially the well, the 50s, and uh, he was appalled by the jacket notes, which he thought were just <laughs> unbelievably idiotic, <laughs> and telling you about this is sad because Mozart had just lost his mother, <laughs> uh, and, and junk like that. So he decided he would write his own uh, uh, jacket notes, which he, he did. And then uh, we had a friend who was a, a friend of mine, actually, who was uh, the wife of a museum, of an art historian museum director called Daniel Robbins, who was uh, at one time director of the School of Design Museum in Rhode Island and then the Fog Art Museum and a very remarkable scholar of modern art, and his wife was an editor at Brazilis. And she told Brazile he, she, he really should ask a book, Charles to write a book. So Brazile had him to lunch and said, uh, I, will, I want to publish a book by you, and I'll publish anything you want to write. So Charles thought about it, and he decided he was going to write a book called uh, uh, the classical style in music, uh, and that I think that was that was it. You, I have the contract somewhere. Uh, and then, uh, about two year, two and a half years later, you received a letter. Uh, Brazil was a very strange man. He, he was uh, very unpredictable, and the editors changed very fast. Yeah. Very few people lasted more than six months. <laughs> so my friend was long out, and uh, some new young editor uh, found the contract and wrote him a letter saying, uh, in view of the fact that it's been two and a half years, this was, the contract was signed in six, uh, 1964. Two and a half years later, letter in the mail saying, since uh, we haven't heard anything, uh, we suggest that you return the advance, which I think was $500. So, which in the time was not nothing, but... And uh, Charles was having lunch with Aaron Asher, who was a very distinguished uh, editor of literary. He was the editor of Saul Bellows and a number of, uh, of major writers at, at the time at Vikings. And he said, well, that's fine, you return you return the, the, the advance, uh, cancel the contract, and we'll double the advance. <laughs> Which is exactly what he did. He didn't uh, call them or anything, <laughs> just returned the money, and that's how it went to, uh, to Viking. And uh, Aaron Asher was the first editor, but then Aaron Asher uh, left Viking, and uh, Elizabeth Sifton took over, and she was a wonderful edit editor. Uh, as well, and she also uh, was the editor of the book uh, called Romanticism and Realism, uh, which we wrote together. So I've worked with her, I can tell you, there is no better editor uh, <clears throat> that I can uh, think of. So this is how the, this is the story of, uh, 
of uh, how it came about, and then it got the book award to everybody's surprise because it's not the kind of books that uh, uh, normally uh, get uh, public, gets the award. <laughs> and uh, actually, I can't resist. There was a, we had a, not exactly a friend, but somebody who was a friend of friends, uh, John Simon, uh, who was, uh, who wrote and, and he was a, he was a nominated for for the for the for the award as well, and uh, he encountered Charles and he said he had an accent because he was from Yugoslavia and he said Charles congratulations for beating me, and Charles <laughs> said oh think of nothing think nothing of it John it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> We, we didn't like him very much. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a, enough anecdotes about uh, this now legendary book. Well, and, and I think there are one or two more pictures. Uh, uh, and then, the, uh, yeah, yes, there are a couple more pictures. So next. Uh, these are, uh, uh, I wanted to show you the picture on the upper right because that is uh, Frank Bell in the middle. Uh, who produced these wonderful uh, uh, videos and also did a terrific uh, recording of a, a concert that Charles played there in, I think, 1995 or 98. And uh, Charles uh, wanted to uh, actually publish two of the pieces because he felt he had never played as well ever. So these were probably... I'm, I'm seeing somebody in New York, and these will be made uh, uh, available to the public. Uh, they are the, the Waldstein uh, Sonata of, of Beethoven and the Brahms Paganini Variations, which is one of the most insanely difficult pieces uh, for the piano. And uh, I, uh, down below is a picture with Fred. Uh, Sherry, who is uh, with us, he may not be here right now, but he was... Uh, Fred, here. are you here? No. No. Fred is here at the festival. He's at the festival, but yeah. The cellist in that picture. The cellist in that picture was a very uh, close friend of uh, uh, Charles and also of Elliot Carter. And the last uh, two pictures I wanted to, uh, to show, uh, which are probably better known, uh, are Charles with the two two composers who were major uh, figures in his life and career, uh, Elliot Carter uh, on, one, on the left and uh, Pierre Boulez on the right, uh, on the right uh, two major figures uh, whom he was associated with. Very, uh, uh, with uh, Elliot Carter for a very long time, that is, since the first performance uh, of the double concerto for piano and harpsichord, which he gave, that Charles gave the first performance of with, with uh, Ralph Kirkpatrick as the harpsichord, and uh, and uh, 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 and he was of course very closely associated with Elliot Carter until the latter's death about two months before his own. And Pierre Boulez, with whom he, he, he collaborated very uh, intensively, but for a much shorter period. Uh, but he did uh, record some major works of Boulez. So, so much for So the, that's the last for, of the pictures. And thank the, you, Henry, yes. for bringing it, if we can have the lights back up. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, Jeremy and I touched on it a, a little bit. Charles had this f classical style, as you heard, was his first book, um, and, and a remarkable first book. And fortunately, it was followed by a number of others. Um, and there was this interesting split, not within himself, but within the musical world. Of where, uh, the, We don't take easily to people who do multiple things extraordinarily well, and we want to categorize. Um, and I wondered if he ever felt pained as his work as a pianist being dismissed because he was thought to be a scholar, or his work as a scholar being dismissed because he was 
thought to be a pianist. Did he feel the split whatsoever, either internally or externally? Uh, yeah, no, it's this still, yeah. yes. Uh, he was not uh, at all concerned about be dismi being dismissed as a scholar. Uh, he couldn't care less. He w did uh, dislike being thought of as a scholar who play played the piano. I mean, he thought absolutely of himself as a pianist who thought about music and was able to write about it. I think that's a simple answer. So maybe I, I, I might add uh, that uh, one might also feel that you know there's a sort of break between these contemporary uh, composers and, and the fact that he played mostly uh, in the classical music. The, the fact is that actually originally he was thought of as a specialist in the French music of the, of the early 20th of, of, He did the first performance of the, the complete performance of the, the first complete recording of the Debussy Etudes actually. And that was mostly what he was famous for uh, at the beginning of his career. He also recorded uh, some contemporary uh, people who were around him. Uh, Martineau happened to be at Princeton at the time, so he recorded Martineau, but I think he's in his own apartment. Uh, mm. That was, I think, his first recording, public That's uh, recording. the Czech composer Bohuslav Martineau, who um, uh, taught at Princeton at the time. Charles Rosen was getting his doctorate, not in music, if you, in case you missed that, his doctorate was in French, French, lit literature, French yes. literature. Although he was, very, he was very close to the music, it was a great music department because Milton Babbitt was, was there already and also some of his colleagues like uh, Ken Levy became very major musicologists uh, and he remained quite close to Ken Levy and Michael Steinberg for many years. Don, um, I'm sure you remember the arrival of the book and I wonder if you'll recall for, for us how it was greeted at the time and how the view of the book has perhaps shifted in the 40 years since its publication. Well, I should begin by taking up where, with a remark Henry made. Charles was very intelligent. <laughs> But he was not only that, he knew Haydn, Beethoven, Mozart, forward and backward, intimately, as a performer. But also he knew all the scholarly literature about this, going back into the 19th century. In addition, he knew Dittersdorf and Stamitz and a bunch of minor composers whom we barely remember in the 18th century. The book comes out. And it was, to many people, shocking. There was a minor industry in musicology of the study of musical styles. And here Charles came along and said, the style was the product of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, the greatest creators of the period, made in some degree out of the works of many lesser composers but the definition of the classical style was something that was created by these three great composers. And he furthermore could say, this really came about in about 1780 with the Opus 33 quartets of Haydn and uh, K271 E-flat piano concerto by Mozart. And the book talks hardly at all about the vast sea of lesser composers that musicologists of the day were very busy grinding out dissertations about. <laughs> well, so this already upset some number of people. Then he proceeded to ground the whole notion of the classical style in this polarity between tonic and dominant about which Jeremy was speaking. And so it had a deeply rooted theoretical underpinning and he shows in that book that he knew the most advanced kind of musical analysis by people like Heinrich Schenker, who was much in vogue uh, in the academy. Um, so he not only knew history, but went against the tradition of studying the vast sea of the, 
underpinnings, but rather went straight to the three great geniuses. He rooted it in this very um, important notion about theory. That went along with a view of sonata form, about which he also had very clear opinions, starting with the fact that what most people are taught in music appreciation about sonata form is really fundamentally wrong. How many of you know that there's a first masculine theme followed by a second lyrical feminine theme, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and he shows on the basis of many, many works that this is just nonsense. This is no way to account for sonata form. So that was another great ripple. And then finally, I guess, the shocking thing was to say that Beethoven was one of the definers of the classical style and was not the first romantic. Well, standard textbook account was Beethoven was the romantic hero. He was the slob living in an attic and uh, going against uh, so forth and so on. Um, whereas Charles showed that Beethoven's music was really deeply rooted in the classical style and that it had it marked the end of this great period and was not the beginning of what came later with Schumann and many other composers, but rather it defined the end of a, a great style uh, from which the later composers uh, had departed quite significantly. So there were uh, at least those three big points that sort of shocked a lot of people in musicology. Add, add to which, of course, he was really a very considerable pianist. And it has to be said, one can't think right away of anyone else, of his accomplishment as both a pianist and as a scholar, who knew every bit as much as the musicologist knew, uh, and who could also play all those pieces very well and could speak about them with real authority. Uh, add to that, of course, he had a wonderful literary gift. Uh, the writing in this book is uh, at moments, nothing short of brilliant. Uh, it's on occasion opinionated, you'd have to say, but that opinion is always rooted in some real knowledge of uh, the facts of the case. So I'll give you just one little example. There, were, there are several the numbers sprinkled through the book that were calculated to upset various kinds of people. So one of, <laughs> one, of, one of the big debates was, in a Mozart concerto, should the pianist be playing sort of continual like accompaniment when the orchestra is playing? And there are some Mozart manuscripts that have the numbers, the figured bass numbers under them that might suggest this. And Charles says, playing continual with a Mozart concerto is perfectly acceptable so long as it is not audible. <laughs> and he, he, had, he had strong opinions about some number of other pieces which were, some number of pieces which were either appallingly uninteresting. I mean, he was capable of dismissing certain kinds of things, but you always knew that it was really rooted in something and was not just mere opinion. One of my favorite things, this is the, the, the paperback version of the original edition, as I said, from the, the 1970s. In the late 90s, was it, Henry, the revised edition came out? Something like that? Yeah, but yes, Don, Don and I can model each, each edition for you. I, I, I have mine here. I must say, I, I will put it in my will because it's inscribed to me by Charles himself. <laughs> um, there's a long preface to the revised edition, and, and it's very engaging to read because Charles answers 20-some years of critics of the book in the preface, and it's a very long preface. And, and <laughs> yes, well, so many people had uh, things to say about this, um, and some of what's in that preface actually started in my living room in Ithaca, New York, when Charles would visit us at Cornell. And there we had very lively conversations with um, a younger colleague, a contemporary of mine, essentially, James Webster. 
and there's much in the preface about what Jim had to say about that book. And in, in our living room after dinner, he and Jim would go at it. Jim, <laughs> Jim was also a guy, n not a performer, anything like Charles or a performer at all, but who really knew this repertory. And so he and Charles would have these conversations in which one or the other of them would say, oh, but wait a minute. The recapitulation of Oprah 33, number two. And, and so, I mean, they just had this music like this. And uh, then Jim wrote a book uh, called The Farewell Symphony of Haydn and the Classical Style, in which he took Charles to task for having said that it only started in 1780 and they didn't pay enough attention to the earlier Haydn pieces and so forth. But various other people tried to pile on. A certain amount was said about his view of opera. So Charles had the view that underlying the Mozart operas was this tonic dominant polarity deeply rooted in sonata form as Charles understood it and explained it. And there were a number of scholars who said uh, that the operas don't really behave this way. There isn't long, long term, large scale structure of the kind that Charles found there. Um, what has, how has its reception changed over, over the years? Is it um, in, in scholarly um, circles, is it now accepted to some degree as a central work? Well, I think there's no question that it must be reckoned with till this day. Uh, people probably don't argue about it quite as much as they did for a time. There was a somewhat new turn in musicology in the 90s toward all kinds of things you will know from other humanistic fields, gender studies, all sorts of things about how music is uh, the expression of somebody's ethnicity or cultural background. And Charles was much more interested in musical structure and not interested in sort of inventing stories about how this music comes out of some particular cultural moment. How much do you think his life as a performer, as somebody who, who lived in realizing these pieces and in the sound world of these pieces and these pieces over time rather than, you know, as living sonic experiences over time as, as opposed to score study informs his perspective in this book? Well, I think it derives uh, both his scholarly study of this music and his performance of it derives from something deeper that the two have in common, namely this intelligence or whatever we should call it. I mean, after all, there are very many, we would say, quite gifted performers who really don't have anything much or at all to say about the music that they play. I mean, they're, with all due respect and affection, some very hot performers are essentially athletes of a kind. <laughs> um, and Charles was deeply thoughtful as a pianist. Uh, and so I think you couldn't separate in his life the scholar from the performer. It was a kind of intelligence that thought of his ability to perform as an expression of the very same intelligence that enabled him to write a stunningly stimulating book. In, um, among the many memorable passages in the book are studies of Mozart piano concertos and the dramatic progression as a result of um, the harmonic progression and the, the kinds of tensions that, that Jeremy spoke about. And, um, and, and the, 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 uh, the almost operatic or theatrical progression of events in a, in a piano concerto as, as rooted in both structure and harmonic progression. And in a, in a really brilliant stroke of programming, the festival this year includes um, a piece that comments brilliantly on that very topic and in, in a way that I'm sure you never expected, Timo, when you wrote the piece becomes a kind of perfect commentary about the classical style. It is um, a realization that Timo made, and I'll ask him to explain 
what the original source is and what he did to it in a second. Of Mozart's 26th piano concerto in the common numbering, a uh, concerto subtitled often the Coronation Concerto. Um, and if you, if you think about it, of the last extraordinary round of Mozart concertos, that's the one that's performed the least. Um, from, from the D minor number 20 to the B flat number 27, there's almost as if there's a little hole in, 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 in number tw 26. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like the old joke about how many symphonies that Tchaikovsky write, three, four, five, and six. Uh, <laughs> how many last piano concertos if there were there of Mozart? Well, everything minus one, because somehow this, this piece falls out often of, of the canon. Talk a, a little about the piece, Timo, and, and then um, how you came to it, what the impulse to collaborate in a way with Mozart, and, and, mm -hmm. and then we'll ask you to demonstrate a little. So I, I actually didn't know the Coronation Concerto at all. Um, and then a, a conductor friend, I was pre planning a concert with a conductor friend of mine, and um, he kind of alerted me to the fact that there was this Mozart manuscript that was actually missing the left hand part. Um, Mozart wrote in all the orchestra parts and the right hand of the piano, um, but left most of the left hand blank. There are a few passages where he put like more complex, uh, harmonically complex passages where he did fill it in. Um, but, you know, Mozart wrote in a great hurry often, and, and it was likely that he just sort of knew what he was going to do in a performance and never got around to, to filling it in. Um, and, yeah, it, 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 when I listen to the piece, um, which when you hear it uh, most times now, it's been filled in by an editor at one of the publishing houses um, in, in a very sort of dutiful... Um, uh, scholarly, uh, it, the, the, the fewest risks possible are taken. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, which is fine. It's like, that's, that's the job. Um, and so, so Andrew um, commissioned me to do my own completion um, and sort of left it at that, didn't give me any guidance, tell me, you know, what kind of style he was expecting or how faithful um, I should remain to the Mozart. Um, and then, so I was, li I kept listening to this piece um, in existing completions, and it, I think it's fair to say that it's not um, one of the great Mozart concertos. It's, it's sort of, it's a very, um, it's a very large piece, for one thing. It's, it's quite long, and the orchestra by Mozart standards is, is pretty big. Um, and it has a very sort of public feeling. It's, it's a very, um, it, it has a lot of these sort of powerful D major themes that are repeated a lot, and um, there's, you don't get a whole lot of the sort of inward, um, like sexy, tragic Mozart that Jeremy was talking about, um, which is, of course, what we all <laughs> we kind of love Mozart for. Um, and so I, I, in a way, it felt like a particularly blank slate for me to do something um, a little bit unexpected or a little bit outré. Um, and so what I did, I, I kind of, um, I kind of took the existing manuscript as like a, a canvas and filled in all kinds of other music in a way that it would kind of be almost like a separate thing happening simultaneously. So the left hand of the piano um, comments on, on the existing material. It, it takes a lot of Mozart's themes and sort of reworks them in a, a, um, a much more harmonically free and extended way than, than he would have ever done. Um, and, and also it takes sort of the history of the piano concerto um, subsequently. Uh, it's a sort of the style that 
in that Mozart really helped to, to formulate in, in his late concertos of sort of the big heroic piano concerto. Um, and so the, ent the sort of entire history of the piano concerto since then is, um, finds its way into the left hand of my piece. And um, <laughs> the, the effect, I think, I, I, it was really like, I had never done anything like this before and it, it, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't even know, like, I thought, I was so nervous at the first rehearsal. Um, I thought that, I didn't know what the orchestra would do. I thought they might revolt or throw me out. <laughs> um, and actually it was funny because the commission was originally for another pianist. I was writing it for another pianist um, who shall remain nameless. Um, <laughs> And he or she, um, <laughs> actually when she saw, when he or she saw what I'd done. Um, excuse me. Yeah, uh, dropped, dropped out of the gig. Um, and this, this was kind of at the last moment and, and left us in the lurch. Um, and I sort of frantically called all my pianist friends, and none of them were free. And so I, I ended up learning it myself. And yeah, it, it, it was, um, it's, it's kind of become uh, a little bit, uh, what's the word, infamous? <laughs> Could you, um, I don't want to give away too, too much of the piece, but would you mind playing a little of the opening of the slow movement? Um, sure. In, both well, in a sort of harmonically standard fashion. Yeah, it's funny. The, and, the, and, 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 and then in your version. This was actually one of the passages that, when I was listening, struck me as like one of the least inspired um, of the existing completions, uh, and I don't, e I don't even know how they go, so I'll, I'll make something up. <laughs> Mozart's um, theme to the second movement. I sort of um, gave it kind of uh, a little bit body, like Rachmaninoff uh, <laughs> harmonies in, in my version. I had the great experience of listening. There's a wonderful recording Timo has made on Nonsuch Records that I know is um, uh, being sold at the great book and recording kiosk uh, at the festival. And, and I had the unique experience of listening to it while driving up the Pacific Coast Highway on, on my way here. And I had not heard it. I'd heard the excerpts from it, but I'd not heard it all the way through. Did you through. have to pull over? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I drove safely. Uh, um, but there is a temptation to <laughs> swerve suddenly. Um, the one thing, uh, the, the, I, I, I want to leave the, the last comment to Don because he heard a rehearsal of the piece and to cir circle back to how profound our expectations of harmony are as listeners and how conditioned they are because this, it's on a 
on one very important level, the tug of this version of the piece is, is, is about that. But uh, Timo, before we left you, I wanted to say what struck me among many other things is that it's not a mustache on the Mona Lisa. Uh, it's no, not, I mean, maybe it's, in a it's couple not, of places. It's, but... it's not graffiti or disfiguring. It's a kind of dialogue. Um, right, I mean, I, it, it, it kind of gets back to, to what I think is a useful way um, for, at least for a composer, to think about music history, which is not as a sort of tele teleology, as like a timeline of, of like kind of musical technological progress, but more as just like a pile of stuff that keeps getting bigger. Um, and the, the, the pile at this point is so large and, and various that um, it can be quite overwhelming, actually, to, to sort of know, um, like, because when you're writing an original work, it's like, what is your, what is your place in the sort of musical firmament? And like, I grew up studying classical piano and studying all this, you know, the, the repertoire that, that Rosen wrote about and, and grew up with his book on Beethoven sonatas. And um, that stuff is kind of the, the closest to my heart. Um, so actually, I mean, I, some people might take it as, a, as like a middle finger or a mustache. Um, but it actually, it, it, I have to say, it comes from this place of, of deep love for classical music and for Mozart and Beethoven and, and these composers. And um, I'd, I mean, I'd like to think that, that they would at least be amused by what I've done. I don't know um, what they would make of it or, or what Charles Rosen would make of it, for that matter. <laughs> Don, um, in, yes, of course. Uh, I just wanted to say a word uh, in relation to what Don Randall was saying. Uh, when you asked him about uh, <clears throat> performer and, and writing, there's one thing that was mentioned, which is in, in his relation to the scholarly world, which is the, the issue of hearing and listening, uh, which I think is, is, is crucial. That is, what he, his uh, critique or discomfort with a lot of uh, critical uh, writing on music is that it was based on looking at scores uh, and, the, and not on listening and making no difference between what is hearable. And, and uh, uh, by the way, that, that fits in with, with the idea that you, know, you can play the, <laughs> the continuum as long as you don't hear it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but, but for him, you know, that was crucial. You know, what, what do you hear? What are the, 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 the sort of acoustic relationships? And uh, that went, uh, I think, partly with his great uh, concern with, with uh, uh, coloring in, in performance so that uh, you can distinguish lines and things uh, like, like that. I'm sorry to... No, no, please. One, one of the things he said about some analytical studies of this music was that it was all very interesting, but it would be equally true if you played the piece backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember him saying to me once something like what uh, Henry said that, uh, you know, low-grade music critic goes to a concert, hardworking person, has to write in a hurry, knows that Charles has a PhD. So without hearing a note, first thing to say is, well, he's an intellectual and he plays in this very intellectual way. And Charles, it just drive him nuts, and it drove me nuts, too. He said, I would rather this critic would just say, Rosen must have been nervous last night because he didn't loosen up until the third movement or something like that, <laughs> rather than to say it's because he has a PhD in literature. <laughs> but the, the thing about Timo's piece, I thought, um, that is so interesting, uh, also rests in something that Charles has said, because one of the things he was criticized for in his book was that he didn't give enough attention to 
the many formulas in 18th century music that all these lesser composers used. I mean, you know, and you know, lots of us could go to the piano and make a plausible 18th century sounding thing using these formulas. And, and Charles said, no, it's not about those formulas. And he didn't address them specifically because it was his view that it was Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven who could take that material and make something really important out of it. So it didn't rest on those formulas. It transformed those formulas into something very much greater. And so with Timo's piece, what you hear is a certain number of expectations in the, coming from the right hand, where, you, where there are many formulas, as you say, uh, and your experience of 18th century music leads you to expect certain kinds of things, and then you discover there are many other things that could flow from those same propositions. <laughs> that is, you, you could take this formula and you could make it into something wholly different. In a way, what Charles was saying was that Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven made those formulas into something wholly different. And if you're in the 21st century, you can make those formulas into something wholly different still. I promise you, I heard, I heard the uh, first movement in rehearsal this morning, my first experience of the piece. The first movement has more shocking stuff than, <laughs> than you heard just now. And I promise you, um, you will not be able to keep from smiling a good deal of, deal of the time. Yeah. <laughs> but you'll if, also... If you didn't hear Timo said, that's encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's at moments extremely witty uh, and very stimulating all the while and, and played brilliantly. It's not an easy piece to play that you have composed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. With, with that thought, I think we'll, we'll take a break. Um, I want to join you in thanking Don Randall, Timo Andrus, and Henry Cerner. We'll be back at 3 in 20 minutes.
Check, check, one, two. Check, check, one, two. I mean, it was, I, I, I 
good water, you don't need another? Okay. Welcome back. We'll uh, reassemble for the last of these Ojai talks. Um, and um, it's a pleasure to spend all of this time, not only with those of you who are gathered here, but um, these talks are being live streamed um, online. And so reaching an um, audience uh, around the, the world. And somebody who was just here said they had the unusual experience of watching a World Cup game on mute while watching an Ojai. <laughs> so I'm not sure if we can compete with the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, before I uh, introduce our guest for the last uh, of, of these conversations, I, I just wanted to do a thank you to Mike Tregler, who has been running audio, video, and everything else we've thrown at him. So. <laughs> Um, Mike has been very patient with each of us running up and saying, do you suppose we could do this or can we project this and integrating it with the video stream? So thanks, Mike. Um, it's my great pleasure to um, welcome uh, the rest of the creative uh, cast of uh, the uh, classical style, an opera parentheses of sorts which is its formal, for, formal title, uh, the director of the opera, Mary Birnbaum, and the composer of the opera, Stephen Stuckey. <laughs> and, and I've kept my institutional affiliation modestly quiet up until now, but could I just say Mary Birnbaum, who teaches in uh, the vocal arts, the James and Ellen Marcus Vocal Arts Institute at the Juilliard School, and as of this fall, Professor Stephen Stuckey of the composition faculty of the Juilliard School. <laughs> And, and poor Steve, um, who had a, an extraordinarily distinguished career as professor of composition at Cornell University, everywhere he looks, remember Don Randall was here just a moment ago, there's somebody who has either been his boss or is about to be his boss. <laughs> <laughs> I've um, been pretty lucky with bosses. <laughs> Um, Steve, why don't we begin with you? At some point, you got a call that at least must have stopped you in your tracks. Uh, how, did, uh, how did the idea of writing an opera on Charles Rosen's classical style come to you, and what was your first reaction? Well, I got uh, some sort of a warning from Tom saying, I'm going to call you because I have a crazy idea. Now, that's not the first time I've heard that from Tom. <laughs> And um, up until this point, most of those crazy ideas had somehow petered out before I was too deeply implicated. Um, this time he called and said, we have a really crazy idea, and Jeremy was on the line. He said, Jeremy uh, would like to write an opera on Charles Rosen's The Classical Style. And I think there was dead silence on my end. I mean, <laughs> as everybody in the, room, in the room knows, it's not an obvious idea. Um, I'm a great... Uh, lover of that book and of Charles's um, positive and complicated role in the intellectual history of, of music and of the studies of 18th century music over, the, over my whole lifetime practically, but it had never occurred to me to find a dramatic arc um, <laughs> or, or to make uh, opera buffa characters of my heroes in that <laughs> book nor to make characters of uh, the basic chords of tonal music. So um, I said, I, you know, that's a really interesting idea, and I think you need a very special kind of composer, and I have a couple of phone numbers for you. <laughs> <laughs> but over the months, they kept calling back and saying, no, we really think you're the one. And I said, no, I'm really not. And also, it's too, it's too late. This thing is next summer, you know. Um, and here's another phone number. But... <laughs> Uh, then Jeremy began to send me scenes and whole chunks of the libretto, and I was laughing so hard I accidentally said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So given, given that genesis, where and how did you begin? Well, we had an early draft of the libretto, um, which was longer than this one. Um, and we had, uh, you know, Charles was famous for getting into fights, and I actually witnessed some of these fights that Don, <laughs> Don mentioned in Ithaca, New York. Uh, so we had fights about how long it was. It could have gone two or three hours easily. Um, and it's about 70 minutes, just to, to, to reassure you. <laughs> well, if you do your job and laugh enough, it'll be 75 minutes, okay? <laughs> Um, we, we had a libretto of about 80,000 words at some point, wow. which is on the scale of Richard Strauss, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we began to lose some scenes. I'll just tell you, I don't know if Jeremy would approve of this, but I don't see him. Um, <laughs> there was, for example, a scene which is now on the cutting room floor in which Haydn comes to Hollywood and takes a meeting with Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> whom he is trying to convince to, uh, to back a, a biopic of Haydn, because Mozart and, he and Beethoven have movies, but Haydn doesn't have them. <laughs> and unfortunately, we had to leave that one out. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth with cutting and rearranging and so on. Um, and it, was, it turned out to be, for me, a beautiful partnership once we found our rhythm. Uh, and I, I became one of Jeremy's greatest admirers. Uh, we, we had never met before, and now he's one of the most important people in my life. So, as a musician and as a, as a fellow lover of music. Talk a little about the very difficult task of writing music about music. Um, for those of you who know Steve's works, you may recall that one of the, the first works that brought him to prominence, actually internationally, is a piece called Dream Waltzes, which is a, a kind of a gloss on uh, Strauss and their Rosenkavalier. So this isn't your first time in writing a piece about another piece, but what, what particular challenge does it present to a composer to write music about music? I, uh, let me circle back for a second. Uh, it's true, that I've, done, I've written music about music several times. I'm of the generation um, in which writing music about music uh, was a, a new and exciting idea in the hands of people like George Rothberg and Luciano Berrio. Uh, and that at a very formative stage in my life. So it was a natural thing for it to be part of my view of what a composer does to be in conversations with um, this heap of stuff, as Timo put it, not a teleology, you know, not a, not a progression from more primitive to more advanced music, uh, hardly that, actually, but, but this wonderful heap of stuff that, we, that is our cultural heritage, and it remains alive you know, for us. Um, I think that's why Tom suggested me to, do, to Jeremy, because I had um, not vandalized, not... Um, not drawn the mustaches on, but had conversations with dead composers who could no longer defend themselves uh, <laughs> several times in the past. In the case of this piece, you know, to have as your three main characters, the big three, as we call them in the opera, um, is a little bit intimidating. I thought that um, I needed to write music that was essentially in the classical style, and that was good enough to be plausible and bad enough to, be, to, to make it clear that we were also satirizing what we were doing. Um, the making it bad enough wasn't so difficult, the making it, <laughs> <laughs> the making it plausible is, is a challenge, but um, I finally have come to understand that those decades of teaching sophomore theory have come in handy after all. <laughs> What was, um, what was the first keeper scene? What was the first music you wrote from the opera that, that's um, now, that has remained there? I started at the beginning and, um, and wrote some music essentially in my language, which was sort of we're in heaven music. And it was, a, it was a placeholder. I told Jeremy, that's not really it. I'm coming back and fixing it up later. Of course, there was never time for that, so that's still how the old opera <laughs> begins. Uh, and, um, and that's a kind of a key to the musical language that you'll hear tonight, that um, it goes all the way from fake Mozart to 
genuine Stucky, whatever that is, you know. <laughs> um, and everything in between, because there is the threat hanging over the classical style that it won't persist, as of course it couldn't, um, and the threat of you know, future musical languages, um, those, that music is always hovering in the background too in the person of composers like Strauss and Wagner and even Schoenberg and even whatever, whatever I do. <laughs> um, and so the very first page is by me, and the second page is Haydn complaining about his lot in the afterlife, um, about getting no respect, and singing in a kind of perky, um, quasi 18th century style. And, you know, from there on it's a kind of, it's a kind of poor man's Ulysses, you know, where one association begets another one. Mary, um, at some point you got a call about what I'm sure seemed like an unlikely um, project. Could you talk to us about your, how you became involved and um, wonderful for a director to be involved in the genesis of a piece where um, there's no particular performance history. It's one that comes with complications for a director, but um, how did it all begin? Well, um, I started to get involved in November of this year, and uh, I was pulled into the project by the wonderful Alec Troyhoft and uh, Peter Cazares, who were both serving as casting consultants. And um, they wanted somebody who was smart and nerdy, but not so nerdy that she would complicate everything on top of, uh, of what was already written. So I could frankly say that I am the only person in the room of uh, our rehearsal room that had never taken a music theory class. I am the person who struggled through uh, Charles Rosen and made it through the other side, but I wanted to make sure that the heart of the piece, which is so essential to what Jeremy and Steve do, really shone through and, and was communicated to people who aren't totally secure in their knowledge of the tonic and the dominant. <laughs> so. but, and le let alone the dangerously seductive subdom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in, in, in ways that will become apparent. She, <laughs> she is way dangerous, believe me. <laughs> I, I love what you said just now because from top to bottom or from side to side, the whole creative team is a bunch of nerds. And this is I think of this occasion as not the revenge of the nerds, but somehow our one little moment in the sun. <laughs> allowing us to celebrate ourselves for our nerdiness. Um, there's, a, there's a moment like that in the opera, I won't give it away, but you'll see a nerd have his own moment in the sun uh, in scene four, and it's, a, I think, a delicious moment that Jeremy dream, dreamed up. It's, an, an, an incredibly referential libretto for all the obvious reasons. Um, not only is it constantly about our three leading characters, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, um, but it's about their works. Um, and clearly when you're talking about their works, those works and the expectations those works raise become a central issue. Um, in realizing this libretto. And let's begin with, with the music. How do you cope with a piece that has references to probably several dozen um, specific works as a composer um, and, and create something where those references have musical and dramatic meaning? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, you've done a pretty damn good job, so dig deep. <laughs> there, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful and big opportunity to play the field um, because of the nature of the piece, and also probably a danger. Um, if the score were simply a collection of inside jokes about the repertoire, or, or even, even worse, inside jokes about music theory, whatever, whatever those might be, um, then one wonders if anybody wants to, wants to sort it all out in the audience. So um, I, the first challenge, I think, was to make it operate on several levels. Um, so if, for example, uh, I'll answer the reference question in a minute, but if, for example, you don't really want to remember the difference between tonic and dominant, 
you won't miss the difference between a sort of chest-beating narcissist with big muscles who talks only about himself and a needy, unresolved, whiny, <laughs> single woman um, in this case. You don't have to know the music theory because the characters are so vivid um, as Jeremy drew them and as you helped them, you know. And I think as Rosen, I think one of Rosen's great gifts um, is that he made these musical terms vivid and human for Jeremy. Um, and that's, that's sort of what infuses our sense of them in the opera too. Having said that, I, there's, there is a range of reference to existing pieces or just allusions to the style itself. There was some talk about um, how classical style is really a collection of formulas and cliches in the hands of the great, uh, which in the hands of the greatest composers transcend their status as cliches. Um, in, I'm not being modest when I say those same cliches in my ha hands are not meant to transcend their status. They're meant, they're meant to help define, you know, the, the, the territory tonight. Um, but, um, for example, in the first scene, Mozart sings what uh, you would call in a Mozart opera a rage aria. There is, there are essentially, there are virtually no references to actual Mozart pieces in that rage aria, but as it would be in, in, in Mozart, it's in D minor, and it's in the tempo of a rage aria, and it has some of the, you know, the raginess of a rage aria. <laughs> um, and so playing with conventions is one level. Um, making references to specific pieces, there's a moment, one of the things that Jeremy required me to do, damn him, you know, uh, and which I, all right, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, Is that revenge of the nerds? <laughs> <laughs> it was revenge of the music director, I think. Um, it, uh, he had the brilliant idea, which I put off to the very end, of staging a symposium or seminar about sonata form in an academic context with a bunch of blathery language, um, of having that, that scene be composed in sonata form. So I had to write a symphony movement, which uh, simultaneously is an operatic scene and has all this, lots of text in it. It was hard and, <laughs> and instructive. <laughs> but I wrote the whole thing from scratch. It has almost no quotes in it, except that everything one does in that form is a sort of quotation of a formula. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't try to transcend it on the level of Mozart and Beethoven, but there are one or two jokes. I'll just tell you that when Mozart comes in and announces himself, there's a famous three-bar event from the Jupiter Symphony, which you won't notice. But you'll hear Jeremy and me laughing at that point. <laughs> and it's okay. Don't worry about what you're getting and what you're not getting. There's plenty on stage that's funny and also touching without the subtext of musical references. Uh, Mary, that's a, a good transition to the complication of your job, which is, on a certain level, it's, it's, it is a kind of entertainment, a sort of musical vaudeville. Um, and yet, what's being talked about is music that's deeply loved and has very powerful effect. How, how, how do you go at getting those layers to coexist? I think the most important part for me was that they were all human. They, I mean, the composers sing, the three composers, the big three in the first scene sing, we're just busts on a shelf. And if you look at the sort of history of movies about these composers, books about them, there's a tendency to heroicize them in such a way that you can't ex access them as humans. Of course Mozart was struggling with his financial uh, life, all of his life. Of course he would, if he were in heaven, he would want more money uh, from the producers of Amadeus uh, than, he, than he got. That kind of stuff that we can relate to, um, not as you know, huge monolithic composers, great artists, but as people, um, it w was really important to me in the staging of this opera. So that everybody is on stage as human, and that Rosen is the most human of all, and the most um, uh, sympathetic and also uh, deep, as he as he lectures at us. Well, and and Charles Rosen himself is 
emerges as the central character. He's the subject of the quest. How do you, how did you write for Rosen? We were all careful, I think, and Jeremy was adamant about this uh, and set the tone for, for, for both of us that um, Charles was not a figure, of, is not a figure of fun. In fact, there's only one real, well, okay, there are figures of fun, but, 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 but the big three and, and Charles are, are taken seriously as human beings, actually, although they have their con comic moments. Charles comes off as a lyrical, noble uh, conversationist that one would like to spend time with. And in addition as somehow isolated and sad in contemplating the death of the classical style, which after all is what's going to happen and what in effect does happen at the end of the opera. The, um, as we mentioned, and Jeremy brilliantly introduced the characters to you in their musical identities, um, a key element of the opera is the presence of uh, tonic dominant and subdominant, um, not as concepts, but as flesh and blood people with real psyches of various foibles and um, uh, various dimensions. Um, Mary, talk about creating, I mean, that's gotta be one of the more idiosyncratic assignments for a stage director as characters named tonic dominant and, and subdominant about bringing them to life. There is a four page aria in which uh, pretty much the only word is me. <laughs> so that was, that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, That's for tonic. <laughs> for tonic. Not surprisingly. So, it's all about me. Right. Exactly. Um, but I think if you, if you come to see the show tonight, you'll recognize these people as archetypal, but also um, people who we all know, uh, hopefully. And setting them in a bar was actually a stroke of genius um, because they are all kind of questionable, they are all of, of questionable intentions throughout the scenes. So there's a seaminess about these three chords that uh, probably was not intended by Charles Rosen and uh, that, that makes it so much fun to watch as they have flaws and, and human errors but also desires of their own. But uh, when, see, see, when working with singers and bringing, bringing this to life, you know, the classic, what's my motivation? How did you work with well, your so, cats to say, subdominant now? Yeah, so you have to, I, I think I approached it as uh, trying to find somebody from pop culture or uh, from literature or from film that sort of reminded me of uh, these people. One of them was, um, there's a Bravo TV show called Million Dollar Listing. And there's a real estate agent on it uh, who is a very slick, sort of seedy New York real estate agent, will sort of sleep with anything that moves and is very up on himself. And I, and I uh, immediately plucked him out for Tonic. This is, this is exactly who this guy is. So we kind of dressed um, Aubrey Alacock, who plays Tonic, as... Uh, Ryan from Million Dollar Listing, which I, I only deem appropriate because Jeremy and Steve, in addition to being total geniuses, um, are incredibly parlant um, about mo modern culture and pop culture. Um, and that's, that's one of Jeremy's uh, fantastic things is to go sort of back and forth between Bravo and Rosen. <laughs> Extrapolation, but there you go. <laughs> and, and as an aside, one of the things we haven't mentioned, and, and if you haven't run across it, I can't recommend it to you highly enough. Um, some of the most both illuminating and entertaining reading to be found is online in Jeremy Denk's blog. Um, there are lots of knowing nods. So I'm glad you've, many of you have discovered that it's called um, Think Denk. Um, and if you just do a search on Think Dank, which is not hard to remember, um, you'll, you'll run across his blog and um, you'll, you'll go to anywhere from an extraordinary um, investigation of the music of Brahms and how it works and how the late piano pieces have an emotional hold on us and how they work and why in a way that I think is very much influenced by Charles Rosen. And then the next thing will be grumpy and on the road, um, a pianist in search of a decent cup of coffee while touring. Um, so it really runs the gamut. And I think that range is very representative 
If you dig deep enough on that blog, you'll find his first dramatic effort, um, a, a five-act tragedy called Romeo and Juilliard. <laughs> <laughs> I will only say it is mercifully unproduced as yet. <laughs> But it is very funny. <laughs> and I say that as the dean of the Juilliard School, so. <laughs> we should make it happen, or You know, seriously, and because Jeremy's not here, we can say this as long as no one reports it to him. Um, Did I mention this is streaming live online? <laughs> <laughs> what was your next question? <laughs> no, I mean, um, and, and not, not, to, not, to, not to drive this too far, but, um, it is difficult to think of a pianist of Charles's um, caliber who was also a thinker of his depth, who was also a writer of his beauty. Uh, and Jeremy is, is such a person. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, a mysterious character <laughs> whom we haven't mentioned yet turns up in the opera. Um, uh, he's uh, a man of a certain imposing presence um, who wears a black eye patch, which may be a clue to his identity. He's not a pirate. Um, um, he is missing a spear. Um, <laughs> and wearing the eye patch on the wrong eye. For all well, because he has to see the conductor out of his good eye. <laughs> <laughs> and um, because we wanted it that way. But, <laughs> could, could, could you both, um, I, and I neglected to ask Jeremy about his appearance, could you tell us why the person who mysteriously may either be Wotan or Richard Wagner suddenly turns up in the opera? I, I am not sure what we are authorized to say, <laughs> but um, and because this character is not named in the libretto. Uh, although uh, he is in print, but not, no one says his name on stage. Uh, but he is a famous and famously uh, mysterious and dissolute chord from the future of music, who <laughs> turns, turns up in the bar where our codependent love triangle, tonic, <laughs> dominant, and subdominant. By the way, if you don't have the t-shirt, it's a classic, and it's only $25 in Libby Park. Um, <laughs> turns up in the bar where they're having a lover's quarrel and warns about the, gives a dark warning about how all hell is going to break loose uh, when the, when the, as music develops and they should enjoy it while they can, <laughs> this, this, this wonderful uh, uh, relationship that they have as, as the three main chords. This, is that, I haven't yeah. gone too far yet because I didn't, I didn't say his name, right? No, you're good. <laughs> I, I think, um, yeah, the really, the really touching part of that is the way you wrote the music, um, Steve, that it, it, it sort of, we veer slightly more modern than the classical style and then we return back to the classical style at the end of the scene as the threat is sort of temporarily overcome. Um, but it's an amazing comment on uh, how um, safe and comfortable and easy in some ways tonality is um, versus uh, another unnamed chord and, and the future. Could of you, could I put you to work, Steve? Could <laughs> you, we're not going to reveal its identity, but could you just play the chord? <laughs> 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 well, we won't tell you who it is. <laughs> but that's when all hell breaks loose in tonality land, and this warning for the future is, uh, is, is telling these people arguing about who's more important, tonic dominant and subdominant, get over it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more serious stuff coming down in the future. One of the one of the things about making art that um, sometimes gets romanticized away from the real picture is that it's work. And uh, many of our assignments which turn out to have an aesthetic result are, first of all, technical tasks. They are puzzles to be solved and equations to be worked out and so on in musical terms. And this is one of those cases. 
Jeremy handed, this, handed me this situation, which was too tempting to pass up, but also difficult, where I was supposed to sort of, in the musical language that we we're hearing, turn a knob that went from, classical, from the classical style up to Wagner and passed all the way to, let's say, Schoenberg, and then back. Um, and that was difficult and fun. Um, one of the great rewards of this libretto is that it has all these specific musical challenges to be solved in the privacy of one's own room. And then, of course, that is supposed to turn into an emotional experience for us when we're out together in public. And, and I will say in hearing it that it's, you know, when we spoke with Timo Andrus, we talked about his piece not being a mustache on the Mona Lisa or an act of vandalism. Um, this is a very funny piece, but hearing it now, having seen, seen it evolve and reading the libretto and seeing some of Steve's music early on and now seeing Mary's realization is, I think it's safe to say that for all its humor, it's more than anything else informed by a passion and love for, these, for this music and these characters or as, as human beings. It's first of all a love letter to classical music, not, not just to these people, but to, but to the whole repertoire. And, and then gentle satire about how we over-reverence it, how we over-analyze it, how uh, um, there's not a mean bone in the body of this libretto, I would say, but there are some pretty naughty digs at the way some of us think musicology has gone over a cliff in some ways in recent years. Um, and I'm pretty happy to stand behind that. <laughs> the, I, th I think the likelihood of this being performed at a musicological <laughs> conference is not good. And, and you'll know what I mean when, when, when I see it tonight. Well, you know, one, when of, you our, see it one tonight. of our great fears, we, we mentioned that the, one of the most famous musicologists alive, Richard Taruskin, who teaches at UC Berkeley. We were performing the piece at UC Berkeley next week, and we fear that Richard would, might turn up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's unlikely, um, but I, I, I may be in the bar if that happens <laughs> rather than in the audience. <laughs> you know, I think um, another part of the, the sort of reverence that um, Jeremy and Steve have for the material and um, the entire cast and I came to uh, came to feel very warmly to towards the whole show because essentially it's about three artists who have lost their sense of value and have lost their way. And these artists happen to be more famous artists than uh, all of us combined, but they have have lost their their way. And Charles Rosen is the one who can give that to them. So that's incredibly touching, and it's a quick and easy way in to. Um, what it's like to have heroes and what it's like to never quite live up to those heroes but constantly want to achieve um, something that they, the heroes would be proud of. Mary, one interesting um, aspect to, to the theatrical realization of this is that there are a number of operas which are referred to um, and our knowledge and expectations of those operas, um, and most prominently, and I hope I'm not giving too much away, you can stop me. Um, uh, Jeremy already gave you a warning saying, I hope you know the first scene of Don Giovanni when um, Donna Anna comes rushing in, pursued by um, uh, Don Giovanni, crying for help from, from this relent relentless uh, uh, seducer um, who won't take no for an answer. That's realized in a very different way. Um, and if you could talk, both of you, a, a, a little about that scene, how it plays both on the emotions of that, that scene, but it's also a kind of commentary on that scene. It's difficult to know how far to go. You know, we, we don't want to really, we want the jokes to be fresh tonight, but if, if you don't know the first scene of Don Giovanni and you come tonight, you will know it in a cracked version. Uh, <laughs> It certainly goes off the rails, and um, Don Anna's father, who rushes on to save her, as in the original, finds that um, it's too late because um, a would-be savior in the form of a young musicology student from UC Berkeley has arrived, and um, 
and deflated the situation, shall we say. The, I think the, um, the balance there between lampooning opera and, and just presenting it in its um, sort of natural glory uh, was, became really clear when we played around. I mean, we, we rehearsed for about four days. Uh, and we start, we, in that little time, we played around a bit with style and with um, whether this should be just out and out ridicule, cardboard cutouts on stage of Don Giovanni uh, and Donna Anna, or should it be real people trying to achieve something that then is interrupted? Um, and we came to the, to the realization again that heart is always better, consciousness is always better, and that, um, that trying to fill these people with flesh and blood and want want to perform a great opera and then be interrupted was better than doing the cardboard cutout of, you know, uh, opera on SNL or something like that. But you know, you've done, you've managed to have it both ways and, and you and Jeremy have managed to have it both ways because they are both cartoonish and humanly touching at the same time. I and mean, that's, that's the perfect solution, I think. Was it so difficult, um, the, it's, it's a wonderful, singing and acting cast um, who, who are all very dramatically tuned in and facile, but nonetheless, it's such an um, unusual assignment, uh, these roles. And, and if, if you're seeing it from a distance or not seeing it, it may be a little confusing because everybody plays multiple roles um, in the opera. Um, so it's not exactly, you know, digging into Eugene Onegin, I'm going to become Eugene Onegin and I'm going to absorb everything about Eugene Onegin because there is this both being in the character and the commentary, there are several layers going on at the same time. Is it, was it hard to get the, the, the cast to that multiple la layer? I think the thing about uh, performance now is a lot more singers are constantly called on to be actors uh, and performers on top of the character. And to some degree, singers are always doing that anyway. They're, you know, with one eye, they're sort of looking at the conductor and then another eye towards the audience. That's why it's such a superhuman task to sing. Um, and so they, coming to this project, I think even more so than, than actors in straight theater would, they have a, a sort of toolbox of resources that are just the per them as a person on stage, you know, from doing recitals and from doing concerts. They've had a lot of time to figure out who they are. So they bring that to every character they play. Um, the one thing that we were so grateful for was that Kim Josephson, who plays Charles Rosen, really did his homework um, and watched a ton of videos of Rosen lecturing online, which you can find on YouTube, and they're incredible. So he already came to the table with a bunch of um, mannerisms and stylistic ideas that Rosen himself uh, tended towards. Uh, agree. It, the, the whole cast is wonderful. I, we were so delighted, I think, when, when, when we saw and heard them. They look right, they can act, they sing well, but, but you're right to point out Kim is, a, Kim is an old pro. Mm -hmm. He manages to look like Charles in Charles's later years and to sound somewhat like Charles and to be incredibly affecting on stage, I think. And one reason that the character of Charles never becomes buffoon, buffoonish in the performance is that Kim is playing him as a noble um, and wonderful person. Well, as, a, as, a, as Rosen was in life, as, as the most impassioned champion of these composers. Uh, 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 I should mention, the, happily, the opera has uh, a further life already assured. It's a co-commission between the Ojai Festival, Cal performances at UC Berkeley, and the Ojai North, um, the Aspen Music Festival, and Carnegie Hall. So, um, yeah, that's a pretty good start for an opera. <laughs> and, and you know, one of the great challenges for you, for all of us, but especially for you, Mary, is that in each of those venues, different amounts of staging, lighting, and so on are possible. So it will never be exactly the same production twice. Um, here in Ojai, uh, outdoors, and without a full complement of theatrical lighting, and with the necessity of doing very discreet amplification and so on, I mean, there's one style of production. With the orchestra on stage, so the playing area is reduced, all of that. Um, and then Hertz Hall will be a different 
Yeah, two entrances versus three. Very, very subtle changes, but they change the staging. That's, that's important. Yeah. And then, uh, and then Carnegie will be even more sort of stripped down. But that's great because having done the full painting, we can afford to then give sort of brush strokes that detail um, what what the piece is. Then I'd much prefer to do it this way than the other way around. The Berkeley performance is in a week time, week's time as part of Ojai North. Ojai goes north to Cal Berkeley. Um, and then I think the New York performance is in December. It's December 4th. At Zankel Hall, at Carnegie Hall, and then Aspen is planning it for next summer, the summer of 2015. And one other important co-creator uh, uh, that should not go unmentioned is Robert Spano, who's conducting uh, the opera tonight, and who is the music director of the Aspen Music Festival, and and I think he'll follow the cast, and and Bob will follow the production all the way through. Uh, all right? four performances or, or sets of performances will be conducted by Robert Spano. We are so delighted with him. I mean, he he came in knowing the score somehow. I mean, I don't know when he found time, find, found time to learn it, um, and he's absolutely rock solid in rehearsal. Um, with the singers and with the instrumentalists. And he is so invested in the music and the comedy as a person that we had to stop the rehearsal the other day and give the orchestra a full union break because he was laughing so hard <laughs> and could not recover for about 20 minutes. <laughs> That's the kind of person you want on your team, you know. Steve, I I'm, would like to give the last word of the day to you because um, you know, what Rosen did so eloquently is write about music and, and bring music to life. And you yourself, as, as an author, have written very eloquently about Witold Ludoswowski's music, for whom you're a great champion. But I'd, I'd love kind of the closing thoughts from you as, as a composer in what you expect writing about music to achieve and what, what you would like to see uh, achieved and, may, and maybe what Rosen succeeded at so well. It's an interesting phenomenon, in, more in, in, the, in the study of 20th and 21st century music than it was in the study of classical music, but people who are not professional musicologists who make some kind of pioneering contribution. The first important Bart, uh, 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 biography of Bartok was by a composer who happens to have been a USC professor. Uh, um, Halsey, uh, Halsey Stevens. Stevens. Um, the first main biography of Litzlavsky was about me because we couldn't get, we couldn't find anybody else to do it. Basically, you know, um, what happens when composers write about other composers is, and I've discovered this, not in a bad way, I think, but in a, but in a genuine, uh, pointed way over the years, is that one is very often writing about oneself. <laughs> that is that. Um, my relationship to my own music and my relationship to, 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 to the music of others can't be sorted out from some more objective writing about music if, as if that were even possible. Um, in the case of Charles, uh, you know, I was a second year graduate student or, or first year graduate student when that book came out. Um, I was among the first generation to purchase it. It's been part of my life ever since. My way of thinking about uh, Viennese classical music um, in includes a very large dose of Charles Rosen um, and, and of, the, of his detractors and interlocutors, you know, who carried this discussion on for a further 30 years, and of Charles getting the last word in his second prologue <laughs> uh, in a recent edition. Um, but I'm very much aware that um, we we have only, in the end, a personal relationship with, with, with other music. Uh, however, we, we might try to sort out um, theoretical and historical and cultural refinements. I discovered in the writing of this piece, uh, in which I needed to think as much as I could about the music of the Big Three, which of course has been with me since childhood, um, I found out, for example, that I have some gaps. I don't know Haydn very well. I know Beethoven pretty well. Mozart is the bedrock of my life, it turns out. Uh, and I discovered this 
in the course of writing this piece or rediscovered that that you know when I think of um, of a supreme model of how that language functions forgive me for saying it but the as good as those other two guys are, the harmony and the counterpoint in Mozart are the best. And, and he's the person I've learned the most from. And he's the person who, in the form of, not quotations exactly, but, you know, fundamental concepts about how you move notes around, is the most present. He's the person I had to, you know, most often hold his hand or hold my hand during the, during the writing of this music. And he's the person I'll be thinking the most about tonight. My thanks to all of the participants and uh, this afternoon, Mary Birnbaum and Steve Stuckey. And thanks to all of you. We wish you a wonderful festival. Thanks for joining us.